conference, The Legacy of Keynes, with words from the Pilgrim's Progress of John Bunyan, which were read 37 years ago at the memorial service for John Maynard Keynes in King's College Chapel, Cambridge, England. I do not repent me of all the trouble I have been at to arrive where I am. My sword I give to him that shall succeed me in my pilgrimage, and my courage and skill to them that can get it. So be it. Amen. The president of this college, Dr. John Kendall. We at Gustavus remember with appreciation a time nearly 24 years ago, a time when we were dedicating the Nobel Hall of Science a group of Nobel laureates together with President Edgar Carlson and other persons on the faculty and staff of this college had an idea. That idea was to hold an annual conference on this campus inviting national and international scholars to discuss a major topic of current interest with us and with each other. We also remember with appreciation in a special way today Russell Lund together with his family who made a decision to endorse and support this conference with a generous endowment. We are also thankful for the continuing encouragement of the Nobel Foundation and its president, Stieg Rommel. On behalf of the faculty, staff, and trustees of Gustavus Adolphus College, we welcome you, the honored guests and speakers. We welcome the delegations from nearly 200 educational institutions, high schools, colleges, and universities. We welcome alumni and all others who have chosen to spend these days with us. We are anxious to make this a pleasant visit in any way that we can, and we know that you will find these uh, stimulating and interesting days. Thank you so much for being with us. The chairman of this conference, my colleague, Dr. David Reese of the Department of Economics. Good morning to you all. Welcome to Nobel Conference 22, The Legacy of Keynes. Our program is very full this morning and throughout the conference generally. Therefore, I will content myself with two brief matters for you. I would like to give a preliminary introduction of the Nobel panel. The individual presentations will be preceded by a more uh, substantial introduction. We have with us for this conference, James Tobin, Sterling Professor of Economics at Yale University and recipient of the Nobel Memorial Prize for Economics in 1981. Carl Bruner, Fred H. Gowan Professor of Economics at the Graduate School of Management at the University of Rochester. James M. Buchanan, Holbert L. Harris University Professor at George Mason University. Jeffrey C. Harcourt, University Lecturer in Economics and Politics, the University of Cambridge, England. Axel Leonhoved, Professor of Economics at the University of California, Los Angeles. Lester C. Thoreau, Gordon Y. Billard, Professor of Economics and Management at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, 
the Reverend Canon Ronald Hayden Preston, Professor Emeritus at the University of Manchester, and Baron Stieg Rommel, President of the Nobel Foundation. We welcome our panel. The chair for Nobel Conference 22 fell to me as the result of the sad loss of my friend and colleague, Professor Lionel Anderson, known to many of you. Professor Anderson was the original chair of our conference, and to his good work, we owe much of the success which we full well expect over the next two days. I would like at this time to call on Professor Carl Bruner for a tribute to Professor Anderson. Andy Anderson, I remember him well. I begin with 1964. That was a time when Alan Meltzer, my friend and longtime collaborator Alan Meltzer and I had finished a study on behalf of a Congressional Committee on Federal Reserve Policy Making. I had occasion as a result of that to visit the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis. And that's where my close association and friendship with a small group of economists in the research department of the Fed of St. Louis began. Homer Jones was then the director at the time of the research department. And there was a time there gradually over the second half of the 1960s where a lot of excitement started in monetary analysis and where Andy Anderson was in the midst of the action in many ways. He published at the time, together with his colleague Jerry Jordan, a paper in the Bulletin of the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis. Uh, and that paper initiated quite a lot of debate, very hot debate at the time, and a lot of turmoil. The paper was addressed to some of the central issues at least the way it was seen at the times, uh, the way it was formulated and resulted from some of the discussions of the 1950s, namely about the role of monetary factors, of monetary policy, the role of fiscal policy in the process shaping the aggregate behavior of the economy. Well, the debate flooded along for quite a while, for quite some time, and some of my colleagues here, sitting here with me on the panel, still remember that probably quite well. They, in one way or the other, they were also involved in the exchange of this discussion. Now, this discussion initiated there at the time by this paper of Andy Anderson and Jerry Jordan certainly did not resolve in any obvious way the issues, but it did one thing in retrospect, which I think is important, which is typical for much of our intellectual endeavors. It modified the questions, it changed the issues. We don't have the same questions today we had then as a result. There's no point in going over the ground in the same way anymore. We have different questions and different issues unavoidably emerging. And this is typical in many ways of our whole progress of knowledge if we look over the centuries, that it is not proceeding in that way. Andy Anderson was deeply committed to empirical research, to understand the world we live in. He was so interested and committed to it that at some point, after he had taken over from Homer Jones, a senior vice president and director of the research division, that he shifted back to really concentrate more on his research and his intellectual and scholarly interest while being a member of the research division. Later on, he moved to the University of Florida, where he hoped to concentrate even more on his intellectual interest, where he continued to be committed and seriously interested in our human affairs. There, the battle began, the battle against cancer, which really tests a man to the core. He fought this battle very bravely, 
with great, great courage and determination. And ultimately, he came back to where he came from, from Minnesota here to St. Peter. And I'm aware from various sources and friends which visited here that here he continued in the same way. He was very interested in the students. He loved to work with the students. He was still continuing his empirical research and his interests of all time in many directions. He also continued his battle. And I remember, after I had been invited to participate in this conference, how I talked with him and how much he looked forward to be present here at this conference and to participate actively. Well, he wouldn't be. But in retrospect, I look back and I look at Andy Anderson. And in a way, if I, from the first moment when I met him at St. Louis, throughout these years, it was very clear his deep commitment to his home here in Minnesota. He remained deeply anchored in a Swedish community here in this neighborhood. And in a way, it was quite fitting that he returned back here to Minnesota. Well, if I look back, the way I remember Andy Anderson, he was a man who was joyful, deeply committed to his wife and his children, and a man deeply committed to understand the world, wrestle with it, engage in serious disputes. Many times I saw him at my conferences in Europe on monetary theory and monetary policy, arguing with great civility and courtesy always, arguing very definitely and quite in detail with many other people and contributing in this way usefully to an interesting discussion at these conferences. And I will remember him that way. I will remember him in that way, and I hope some of you will remember him, as a scholarly interested, truly intellectual man, and also a man who enjoyed life and enjoyed his family and his friends. Thank you.
Thank you. There are many close friends of Professor Anderson here, but I do wish for this conference to greet Professor Anderson's wife, Betty, and his daughter, Julie, who are present this morning. Please, would you? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. While we may not have come here exactly to put John Maynard Keynes in his place, we have come to find that place, or even to make that place. That Jeffrey Harcourt is the opening speaker at a conference dedicated to that task is appropriate, for he has done as much as anyone to discover, or even to create, the location of Keynes in 20th century economic theory and practice, to describe the revisions of Keynes as they have been set forth by students of Keynes, and especially to place Keynes in the cultural 
atmosphere of the time we occupy. Mr. Harcourt is an Australian. He is presently university lecturer in economics and politics at the University of Cambridge and fellow and college lecturer in economics at Jesus College in Cambridge. Previous to his 1982 move to Cambridge, he was professor of economics at the University of Adelaide. He has written biographical studies of the major post-Keynesians. He has explored theories of pricing, investment decision, and income distribution. He has written over 80 articles, and he has written or edited 10 books, including, in 1972, some Cambridge controversies in the theory of capital, and in 1985, Keynes and his contemporaries. I want to welcome to these discussions Jeffrey Harcourt, who will speak on the legacy of Keynes, theoretical models, and unfinished business. Thanks, Bill. And may I uh, thank everyone present, but particularly the organizers, for the honor that they have done me and the other panelists in asking us to come to your uh, campus, which is a really lovely place. And uh, I know because I've already run three miles around the campus this morning, uh, so I'm uh, speaking from first-hand experience. May also just take a minute in a serious vein to say how much I personally, and I'm sure all the rest of you did, appreciated the very fine tribute which Karl Brunner played to his late friend. I found that a very moving but inspiring uh, talk, uh, as I'm sure you all, all did. Now, um, I'd also like to thank Bill for his introduction. Uh, he forgot to say the one thing that I really have a claim to fame for, and that is that I was the only professor of economics who played Australian rules football, uh, which I played till I was 47. Uh, those of you who know what Australian rules football will like will realize that that is quite an achievement, um, that we don't cover ourselves with the ridiculous protective gear that your lot use, and uh, it's quite a vigorous sport. Uh, since I've retired, I've had to write my papers like an Australian rules football match, uh, which has the following characteristics. There are four quarters, nominally of 25 minutes each. However, in the latter days of my career, I played in the reserves, uh, and that had the following characteristics. It had a variable start but a definite finish uh, because we had to be off the ground for the big boys to come on. Uh, so that if uh, my first couple of quarters today seem rather long, remember the big boys are coming and the, la the latter ones will get shorter. Indeed, as I look at the paper, I see that I've become a POM, you know, a to and from, as we Australians say, uh, because I've made it only two parts, so it's a soccer game. Right. Well now, in order to put the legacy of Keynes into perspective, it's useful to start with his own legacy when he decided to become an economist in the early part of this century. And as my own legacy too is relevant for how I see the issues, let me first mention it briefly. I started economics in 1950 at the University of Melbourne in Australia, in Victoria, in a department which traditionally looked to Cambridge, England for inspiration so that the names of Marshall, Pigou, Keynes, Piero Sraffa, Austin and Joan Robinson, Richard Kahn, Morris Dobb and Dennis, and Dennis Robertson very quickly became familiar names to us. This was also a time when most Australian economists were enthusiastic Keynesians, both theoretically and with regard to economic policies in war and peace. My first contact with Keynes's writings was not though with his most famous book, The General Theory, but with his tract on monetary reform written in 1923. We were taken very thoroughly through this publication in our first year of undergraduates if we'd elected to take the honours papers in Economics I. We were guided by a delightful old man called Alf Weller, because of course we knew him as Sammy, and we always used to say, the words are by Keynes and the ums and ah are by Weller. I didn't read the general theory itself until the end of my first year, but I can still recall both the excitement and the incomprehension 
which accompanied my first attempt to understand that most baffling, but I still think, extraordinarily profound and important book. I was lying in bed in my uh, brother and my sleep out trying to read the general theory, and I can assure you if there's one book you shouldn't read in bed, it's the general theory. Uh, reading Robert Skidelsky's Life of Keynes, bed is the appropriate place, but reading the general theory, certainly not. I also read, a, read Harrod's Life of Keynes, and I formed the ambition to do a PhD at what I had come to regard as the true mecca of economists, namely King's College, Cambridge. And since those early days, I've had the good fortune to have been taught by and worked with that unique first generation of Keynesians, those who were either or both Keynes's pupils and colleagues. So that to the list I've already mentioned, and excluding from this Marshall and Pigou, of course, who, well, Pigou was still alive when I went there, but reading detective stories, and Marshall, of course, was long dead, I should therefore add David Champernown, James Mead, Brian Redaway, and Richard Stone. And I just say in parenthesis that when Richard Elvey asked me to come to this conference, after having flattered me by telling me that I was the unanimous choice of the committee to come from the UK, he said, oh, by the way, could you bring James Mead with you? <laughs> I've also spent much of my working life puzzling about those aspects of Keynes's legacy of which I wish to speak today. And with the understanding of these puzzles, I've been much helped over many years by enthusiastic and able Australian Keynesians at Adelaide, notably the late Eric Russell, who was my mentor for 20 years, Peter Carmel and Bob Wallace. I return now to what Keynes himself intended and what he wanted to pass on. And in doing this section of the paper, I'm much indebted to a young Canadian research student in Cambridge with whom I've become very friendly and who I much admire for discussions about these issues, especially the philosophical aspects, and for being allowed access to drafts of his PhD dissertation on the topic, which is called Keynes and Ordinary Language Economics. Keynes himself, and others on his behalf, notably, notably Joan Robinson, claimed that he tried to change our method of doing economics, as well as our way of seeing how our economies work. As to the latter, James Mead has put this very succinctly when he said that, his, that Keynes's intellectual revolution was to shift economists from thinking normally in terms of a model of reality in which a dog called savings wagged his tail labelled investment, than thinking in terms of a model in which a dog called investment wagged his tail labelled savings. To make the case for a change in method though, one which I fear has been aborted in recent years, not only by those who are opposed to all things Keynesian, and I say this with some trepidation in Minnesota, uh, but also by some Keynesians themselves, especially those who are brought up on Keynesian in quote economics, with little or no contact with the general theory and its related writings, as opposed to the economics of Keynes, a distinction which your, our panelist Axel Leon Hooford first forcefully brought to our attention. So we must, uh, in order to take this into account, we need to remind ourselves of two important facts. First, that Keynes came to economics through his own distinctive kind of philosophy and concern with certain philosophical issues. And secondly, that his earliest mentor in economics, and one by whose methods he was greatly influenced, was the Cambridge economist Alfred Marshall. As to the philosophical aspects, Though Keynes read mathematics as an undergraduate, I ought to point out that uh, English students never do anything, they only read. I can still remember when I first got to Cambridge in 1955 and some upper class twit of a year, actually it was a woman, said to me, oh I say Mr Harcourt, what are you going to read? And I muttered something about Agatha Christie and uh, uh, she said, no that's not what I mean at all, what are you here for? So when I say that um, when, though Keynes read mathematics as an undergraduate, he seems to have spent mu as much time on philosophical issues, and he was much influenced by the philosophers as, of his day at Cambridge, McTaggart, G. Moore, Bertrand Russell, Whitehead, and of course, Wittgenstein and Frank Ramsey. His first major research project, as we would say now, was his fellowship dissertation for King's. He was a student at King's, of course. And this eventually became the Treatise on Probability, in, not published in 1921. As we know, the first version failed to get him a fellowship, not least 
So I'm sure I've been told, though for the life of me until last week, I've not been able to confirm it when I found out who actually told me, because of Whitehead's criticism that Keynes was assuming that the whole was only the sum of the parts. His realisation that this need not necessarily be so, that overall systems could have separate lives of their own, that indeed the behaviour of the parts could themselves be constrained by overall relationships, and that profound implications followed from this realisation, not only led him to revise his dissertation and this time be elected, it also profoundly influenced his subsequent work in economics. Here's a typical statement by Keynes of this view. In this instance, in, his, in 1926, in his biographical essay on the great Oxford economist Edgeworth, where he is discussing, and I quote, the application of mathematical method to the measurement of economic value. And he says, mathematical psychics has not fulfilled its early promise. When the young Edgeworth chose it, he may have looked to find secrets as wonderful as those which the physicists have found since those days. This has not happened. The atomic hypothesis, which works so splendidly in physics, breaks down in psychics. We are faced at every turn with the problems of organic uni unity, of discreteness, of discontinuity. The whole is not equal to the sum of the parts. Comparisons of quantity fail us. Small changes produce large effects. The assumption of a uniform and homogeneous cont continuum, oh, I probably said that wrong, but you must make allowance for Australians, uh, are not satisfied. And his full and mature realization of the significance came to fruition in the general theory, not least in one of the meanings which he attached to the term general, and his repeated stress on the need to avoid the fallacy of composition when the workings of the economy as a whole are considered. Thus, in the preface to the French edition of the general theory, which is dated the 20th of February 1939, he wrote, I have called my theory a general theory. I mean by this that I'm chiefly concerned with the behavior of the economic system as a whole, with aggregate incomes, aggregate profits, aggregate output, aggregate employment, aggregate investment, aggregate saving, rather than with the incomes, profits, output, employment, investment and saving of particular industries, firms or individuals. And I argue that important mistakes have been made through extending to the system as a whole conclusions which have been collect correctly arrived at in respect of a part of it taken in isolation. And in the original preface dated the 30th of December 1935 he wrote, our method of analyzing the economic behavior of the present and the influence of changing ideas about the future is one which depends on the interaction of supply and demand and is in this way linked up with our fundamental theory of value. We are thus led to a more general theory, which includes what he called, quite wrongly I think, the classical theory with which we are familiar as a special case. Another economist who had similar insights who, and who made equally profound contributions because of them was, of course, Marx. Now, let me hasten to add, I don't mean Groucho and I don't mean High, I mean Karl, um, who Keynes himself rather despised, and I quote, for being a very poor thinker indeed, though he conceded that he had a penetrating and original flair. So perhaps that'll bring comfort in Minnesota too. Another issue which occupied Keynes in the treatise of probability and which was vitally relevant for his economics was his systematic pondering on the principles of reasonable behavior in an uncertain environment. This major theme of the treatise and the approach and conclusions which Keynes came to fitted very neatly with Marshall's stress, which runs through his principles, on the nature of reasonable behavior of businessmen in particular in their own uncertain environment. And again, Axel Leyenhofer and Robert Clough have illuminated our understanding of these insights of Marshall and Keynes in their writings of recent years. Keynes's philosophical reasoning discerned many different appropriate langu languages for different situations and areas. In effect, he believed that there was a spectrum of appropriate languages which ran all the way from poetry to formal logic, 
and all of which were consistent with arguments being possible and knowledge being acquired. Now this view clashed starkly with the views of Bertrand Russell, the early Wittgenstein and Frank Ramsey of Keynes's day, and dare I say it, it clashes with the attitudes of the mathematical economists of our own day, who sometimes argue as if truth in our subject may only be gained in the guise of a mathematical model. In 1924, Keynes wrote, the gradual perfection of the formal treatment of logic at the hands of Russell, of Wittgenstein and of Ramsey had been, however, gradually to empty it of content and to reduce it more and more to mere dry bones until finally it seemed to exclude not only all experience but most of the principles usually reckon logical of reasonable thought. May I just say in passing that though Keynes was one of the most militant atheists of his days, he had a splendid knowledge of the Bible because he also was extremely interested in language and he understood that the King James Bible had some of the greatest examples of the English language. And one of the sad things of moving into a secular age is that when in your lectures you make reference to biblical happenings, regardless of your belief or not, your audience look at you somewhat dumbfounded ever since Cecil B. DeMille died. Mm. <laughs> Keynes went on to ask, in effect, the rhetorical question, can these dry bones live? And when Frank Hahn, in his altogether admirable crusade against the disaster effects on theory and on practice of the new classical macroeconomics, finds himself at, at times being able only to provide, as he says, arguments that are merely plausible rather than clinching, is he not echoing Keynes's view that if logic investigates the general principles of valid thought, the study of arguments to which it is rational to attach some weight is as much a part of it as the study of those which are demonstrative. To this we should add Keynes's revealing aside in the original preface of his book. The writer of a book such as this, he says, treading along unfamiliar grounds, is extremely dependent on criticisms and conversation if he is to avoid an undue proportion of mistakes. It's astonishing what foolish things one can temporally believe if one thinks too long alone, particularly in economics, along with other moral sciences, where it is often impossible to bring one's ideas to a conclusive test, either formal or experimental. Keynes's philosophical attitudes meant that in his economics, he never liked to stray very far from actual happenings, from concrete situations, and the use of language and concepts and practices which were grounded in them, though he was, of course, exceptionally careful about definitions and the appropriate choice of units for actual theorizing, for his actual theorizing. Thus, in the general theory itself, he placed much emphasis on his chapter four, which is called the choice of units, and he wrote, in dealing with the theory of employment, I propose to make use of only two fundamental units of quantity, quantities of money value and quantities of employment. The first of these is strictly homogeneous and the second can be made so. And he felt that perfect precision was needed for causal analysis and for quantitative analysis whether or not our knowledge of the actual values of the relevant quantities is complete or exact. Now clearly such an attitude is consistent with Marshall's insistence on the use of empirical generalizations as the basis for formal theory in contrast to the very rigorous and precise axiomatic approach which is more the model today. Keynes and Marshall often prefer, preferred to be vaguely right rather than precisely wrong. And they hoped, though their hopes were not always fulfilled, that people would look at their theories, their systems generously and in the large, rather than nitpick about details. Nevertheless, both were very careful to try and to define the limitations of theory and clearly to demarcate where it left off and reality began, to see how far structures could be true in their own domain and a separate point illuminate actual situations. Talking of vaguely right and precisely wrong, and that our discipline is not an exact one, earlier this year I and some other people organised a day for the undergraduates to celebrate the publishing of the general theory, 
and, and we aim to have our celebration when we um, are brought out of retirement some of the golden oldies and then some of the young people like myself, all of 55, uh, to talk about Keynes and the general theory. And we aim to make it on the day 50 years after it was actually published. And at the end of my talk, I had to conclude as follows. Ours is not an exact science. Today is the 8th of February, which we thought was the day on which the general theory was published. However, Judith Allen, who's doing the index of the Keynes papers, has looked it up, and it should have been the 6th of February. Keynes absorbed Marshall's careful, careful definitions of the short period and of the long period, whereby what was and, was and what was not impounded in the set par pound was the crucial distinction, so that period referred to a logical theoretical construction, while run referred to historical situations and events to actual stretches of calendar time. Now that enabled him to adapt Marshall's static supply and demand analysis in a manner which allowed him to tackle the dynamic problems of the trade cycle, or I think you call it business cycle in, a, in America, and to put content to the inherent tendency of capitalist economies to generate sustained and persistent forces which not only brought about prolonged slumps, but also made full employment situations tend to be rare and, um, and unsustained occurrences. In doing so, he shifted the principal emphasis from the long period which his pupil Kahn considered to be the real business of Marshall's principles to the short period. Now in making this step, Keynes departed quite radically from Marshall, especially Marshall of the principles, with his emphasis on normal situations and the equilibrium of supply and demand, which implied an overall situation of full employment. But also Marshall of the never satisfactorily written volume two on money. Now here again, the shadowy world of a Say's law full employment equilibrium position was still the essential backdrop. Uh, as I'm sure most of you know, there's a Frenchman called Say from the 19th century who either is made a hero or a villain, depending on which side of the discussion on uh, whether uh, capitalist economies do or do not tend to full employment. For in the normal world of volume one of the principles, monetary disturbances were absent relative prices and their accompanying quantities were of central importance, while the analysis itself was deliberately partial for all of Marshall's well-known reasons. But there was nevertheless an underlying general equilibrium model of the whole economy, the long period equilibrium positions of which were ones where supply and demand were equated in every market, including labour markets. And the role of the real rate of interest was then to equate saving and investment and to bring about, in effect, the optimum saving program of the community and its inhabitants. And the determination of the overall level of output employment was not an interesting theoretical problem in itself, since in principle it only required that you add up uh, the quantities and employment of the individual markets. Thus a properly constituted volume two on money would have included a discussion of the terms of the general price level, of money prices overall, with which could be coupled the volume of output, uh, overall output implied by volume one. And that would provide in turn a backdrop to the discussions of monetary and banking matters and policy, the appropriate institutional arrangements through which they could be pursued, uh, which could be pursued both stable overall prices uh, at the implied overall level of activity, and which would help to guide the economy with a minimum of monetary dislocation to a new overall long period equilibrium when either tastes or techniques or both changed. So Keynes took over Marshall's method, and in the general theory, he used much space to discuss the forces which determine the equilibrium level of employment, though he did sometimes discuss simultaneously how the equilibrium could be attained. But he later came to regret this mode of exposition. For example, in his 1937 lectures, he wrote, if I were writing the book again, I should begin by setting forth my theory on the assumption that short period expectations were always fulfilled, and then have a subsequent chapter showing what difference it makes when short period expectations are disappointed. I think you can take it that we are about half time now, and remember it gets shorter after this. Uh, we're back in the tog room. The coach is giving us a real pep talk for the appalling display that we've made in the first two quarters. Uh, we're lying, if, we, if we play for a good side, we're lying on a board being pummeled, and if we play for my side, we're just lying on the floor 
absolutely wrecked um, uh, and ready to get ready for the second half. Cain seemed to have his old friend Hawtrey particularly in mind at this juncture, for he mentions in a number of places that Hawtrey tended to confuse the forces which are responsible for how the equilibrium is to be found with those which are responsible for the equilibrium itself, which was his own prime concern. So he adopted Marshall's methods for his own purposes, the determination of output and employment as a whole, the theory of effective demand, once he had convinced himself that Say's law didn't hold so that a general glut was a theoretical possibility, just as it was obviously a practical possibility in the world around him at the time. And to form his theory, he amalgamated Marshall's method with his own insights and mode of reasoning from the treatise of probability of how reasonable people behave in an uncertain environment. It was not so much that in the first instance anyway, he wished to reject Marshall's concept of the normal, but rather that he wanted to adapt it, partly under the influence of Kahn's work on the sustained depression in the UK textile industries, and especially his classic article on the multiplier, to the possibility of underemployment equilibrium situations. In the treatise on money, which is meant to be, Keynes had meant to be his really great uh, book published in 1930, he'd felt inhibited because of Marshall's influence from straying very far into what he called the intricate story of short period output and employment because he felt that a volume on money should be concerned with the general price level and a sophisticated development of the quantity theory which at the time he felt his fundamental equations to provide it. But once he realised that Marshall's dichotomy between volume one and volume two of a principles was a false one, that is to say when he ceased to move, as he said, along the traditional lines of regarding the influence of money as something so to speak separate from the general theory of supply and demand, he was able to construct a theory of the overall activity of a money using production economy in which there would be appropriate roles for monetary matters, especially the rate of interest, and for those, as he said, homely but intelligible concepts of marginal cost and the elasticity of short period supply in an integrated theory of employment, output, prices and interest rates. For Keynes now, the right dichotomy was between the theory of the individual industry and firm, or firm, and of the rewards and distribution between different uses of a given quantity of resources on the one hand, and the theory of output and employment on the, as a whole on the other. And for the latter, he says, we require the complete theory of a monetary economy. And in it, we have to deal with how changing views about the future are capable of influencing the present situation. For the importance of money, he says, essentially flows from its being a link between the present and the future. And this was to be contrasted with the theory he was casting off, which did not imply this importance for money because it tried to deal with the present by abstracting from the fact that we know very little about the future. With this change of view and the important proviso that his principal relationships are concerned with expected variables, especially the values uh, uh, expected by decision makers in the economy, so that we need a theory of expectation formation in an uncertain environment, Keynes was content to use the Marshallian tools of supply and demand to determine the point of effective demand in a situation which was recognizably a Marshallian short period one though it was suitably modified for his purposes of overall analysis. And he spent much more space on the concept of what we call aggregate demand because he thought, mistakenly as it turned out, that the aggregate supply function could be easily recognised uh, as, again, suitably mo modified for aggregative analysis, the Marshall Marshallian short period supply function. In his own thought, and in those of his acute pupils, for example, Laurie Tarshish, the great Canadian economist, it was nevertheless as important as the aggregate demand function, and indeed, these days, it's probably even more important. It's at this point that we can conveniently sketch in Keynes's approach to the modelling of behaviour under uncertainty, remembering always that it's the complications of the models which change, not the underlying real situation. Not that the underlying real situation is static, but we get greater and greater hold on it as Keynes' methods become, or his models become, more and more sophisticated. In a number of places after the publication of the general theory, Keynes set out the conventions which reasonable people will adopt 
because they exist in an environment of persistent uncertainty. And as Jan Kregel brilliantly set out for us 10 years ago, there are three basic models in the general theory and related works, each of which differs from the other with regard to the complexity of the assumptions which are made about the realisation or not, and the independence of not, of short period and long period expectations. In the first model, short period expectations are given and realised, and long period expectations are given and are not affected by short period expectations, so we go immediately to the equilibrium level of activity. In the second model, we get slightly more complicated because we allow short period expectations not initially necessarily to be realised, and we then tell a story how the entrepreneurs react to this, and so the economy and they grope their way towards the short period equilibrium situation, but there is no feedback uh, uh, from the non-realisation of short period expectations to long period expectations. The third model, which is the most complicated one, allows short period expectations not necessarily immediately to be realised and for long period expectations to be affected sometimes by this non-realisation. And this gives rise to uh, what he called the theory of shifting equilibrium, not shifty equilibrium, but shifting equilibrium, an apparatus whereby we may be able to think systematically about the movements over time as well as the determination of the level of employment at any moment of time. Taken together, we have a mode of thought which allows us not only to examine overall behaviour when certain conventions for handling uncertainty are in operation, but also whether events are such as to throw doubt on the wisdom of such conventions holding to expose their essential fragility. Then one may get cyclical fluctuations, indeed deep slumps, just as Joan Robinson was to say later, from mere uncertainty. In a significant way, though, Keynes was to remain in the tradition of the classical political economists and of Marshall in the following sense. They, it will be remembered, sought to discover what they called the sustained and persistent forces which were the principal explanations of natural prices, which themselves were the centres of gravitation of the economic systems which the classicals wished to understand. Now these centres of gravitation were the sources of stability in the system. Keynes and the late Arthur Oaken, the great American economist in our time, adapted these conceptual ideas to an understanding of processes at work in modern economies, especially to make the point that certain key variables, if not naturally stable, needed to be made so. Keynes himself stressed the efficiency wage unit as the key variable on which to concentrate. Such an attitude avoids excessive preoccupation with very short-term factors, in particular treating the world as if it were a set of instantaneously clearing market days because of the great flexibility of prices in various markets, a mistake that mars much macroeconomic theory today. If I could just pause to tell a Bob Solo joke, Bob Solo tells the story of two rational expectations theorists meeting on the streets of New York. And one says to the other, there's a $50 note on the sidewalk, as you would say, or on the pavement, as I would say. And the other one says, no, it isn't, because if it were there, it would have been picked up. Rather, the emphasis is on the importance of historical forces, of slow to learn and perhaps even slower to unlearn habits, of the concept of the normal, which can often depart from the immediately expected and yet be more important than the latter, especially in markets where decision makers may con have considerable discretionary power. As I said, the late Arthur Oaken put similar emphasis on these factors, the normal and the norm, not only in explaining how the economy works, but also in suggesting changes in institutions and in designing policy measures. The object of these was to provide lasting solutions to recurring problems. Now to close this section on method, I need to refer again to the case made for the very modern methods of analysis that have been pioneered in particular by Kenneth Arrow and Paul Samuelson. Frank Hahn has perhaps been their most eloquent advocate. His argument is that only by using the preciseness of mathematical definitions and structures can we ever know the conditions under which certain conjectures may be shown to be true. 
and why, as a consequence, the world as we know it may, be not, may not be as such as to provide these conditions. A major task of economic theory is then not description as such, and he reserves his considerable ire for those who claim that it is, and that their policies are based on coherent theoretical structures which have, been shown, which have shown that the predicted results will in fact follow from the implementation of the policies advocated. Now obviously great advances both in our knowledge and of what we cannot know, for it's a paradox of our profession that some of its most personally arrogant members show great humility in the claims which they make for their discipline, have come from the best minds who have used this procedure. My plea is that Keynes has argued and has shown by his own example that the subject matter of social science in general and of economics in particular is such that this is not the only way by which we may proceed and that while it has an honourable place, it's not an exclusive one. And that if we really do accept that Keynes was the greatest economist of the 20th century, we could pay him the compliment of taking his views on method seriously. Well now, would I be uh, straining too much if I took another five minutes to briefly sketch in the unfinished business? Is that all right? right? I always like to appeal as a Democrat and then proceed as an authoritarian. <laughs> So I now move rather more sketch sketchily onto some areas of unfinished business, which I hope may be thought to be relevant to current theoretical and policy problems. A mystery which never, perhaps will never be completely solved is why Keynes, who knew so much about the imperfect competition revolution, nevertheless chose to use the short period Marshallian pricing model for his chapter on prices. Because Keynes not only knew all about Schraffer and Kahn's work, and he's familiar with Gerald Shove's work, he was in fact the reader for Macmillan for Joan Robinson's The Economics of Imperfect Competition. And it's even more strange since Harrod, as Craigle has shown, had pointed out to Keynes in the 1920s the advantage of having imperfectly competitive microeconomic foundations, as we would say now, for the theory lying behind the policies of public works then being advocated. For if expansion of output were to be accompanied by either decreasing or at least constant costs, the fears of the inflationist opposition to public works expenditure with respect to the generation of a wage price spiral could be shown to be groundless. So why didn't he incorporate these theoretical developments in his general theory? And why did he appear so mystified when the Swedish economist Olin referred to, in effect, Keynes' use of perfect competition as his pricing model? To which comment Olin added, when reading his book, one sometimes wonder whether he never discussed imperfect competition with Mrs. Robinson. That's Joan Robinson, not the lady in the film The Graduate. Keynes replied, the reference to imperfect competition is very perplexing. I can't, on see, I can't see how on earth it comes in. Mrs. Robinson read my proofs without discovering any connection. It would seem to me that you're assuming constant physical returns. In general, it never occurred to me that such a situation would exist. I have always regarded, said Keynes, decreasing physical returns in the short period as one of the very few incon incontrovertible propositions of our miserable subject. By 1939, following the researches of Skoletsky, Dunlop and Tarshish, uh, Keynes rather grudgingly and tentatively took on board the imperfect competition argument while eagerly grasping the policy implications which Harrod had pointed out to him a decade or so beforehand. Perhaps the reason may be that as he was knocking over Say's law and abandoning the quantity theory of money and so arguing that the system may settle it as an underemployment equilibrium, one that could be coherently defined in a long period sense, he felt that it would be tactically unwise to take on board in his own framework the second revolution in economic theory of that era as well. That is to, that is to say, it is as if he said to the orthodox of the time, look, I'll grant you everything that Marshall said about the formation of relative prices in terms of those homely and intelligible concepts, and I'll assume a competitive environment, though you can't, so you can't say that I've obtained my unemployment results by slipping in monopoly, um, in which situation everybody knows, except Harrod, that unemployment can result, and yet I will get involuntary unemployment and an underemployment equilibrium. Such a demonstration, he may have thought, 
was more impressive than starting off with imperfect competition as the general case, as for example Koletsky did in his review of the general theory. Be that as it may, and a number of people have mentioned this as a possible inter interpretation, there are a number of other people, of whom Nicholas Cowder is the most prominent, who think that Keynes made a mistake. And I must confess that my own initial reaction when I was a student was try to see what difference non-perfectly competitive micro foundation would make to Keynes's essential story. And I wrote an undergraduate dissertation on just this theme under the inspira inspiration of the general theory itself and a superb article by Kurt Rothschild called Price Theory and Ol Oligopoly. Though Joan Robinson, in her review of Leon Hooford's big book, uh, Keynes in Economics and the Economics of Keynes, pointed out that the British Keynesians started from the concept of a Marshallian short-run situation with a short period supply curve relating the level of money prices to the level of activity. This led straight from Marshall to the general theory. Though she pointed it out, in later years, she preferred to use the Koletskian degree of monopoly model, uh, not only because she felt it captured better actual pricing practice, but also because it had allowed an explicit discussion of the determination of the distribution of income between profits and wages at the same time. In recent years, imperfect competition has been finding its way into many branches of orthodox economic theory. In the area of employment theory, few articles have been more widely admired and also criticised uh, than Martin Weitzman's 1982 paper in the Economic Journal where shades of Harrod increasing returns play a crucial role. Moreover, with the increase in importance of large multinational firms in the operations of an increasingly interlocked world, it seems plausible that modern theory should start with microeconomic foundations of a non-competitive nature. Whether we shall need to modify our traditional policy conclusions with regard to monopoly as a result is still an unsettled question, and here I refer you to Hyman Minsky's recent review in Challenge in 1986 of Lester Thurow's book on policy solutions to American problems, published in 1985. Um, shall I pause for a commercial here, Lester, or shall I go straight on? <laughs> um, Minsky makes an impassioned plea for the virtues of maintaining or re-establishing competitive structures together with the implementation of what he calls sensible Keynesian and post-Keynesian macro policies. Thus he says, Keynes pointed towards a system that combines aggregate policy to ensure full employment with a Brandeis Simons type of industrial policy to create and sustain competitive markets. What Henry Simons called a positive program to create competitive markets, not to create cartels and organize triage. By contrast, one of the most notable pioneers of the study of competitive and non-competitive structures, Austin Robinson, who's a very young 89-year-old, who also played a major part in the Keynesian revolution, remarked the other day that from a macroeconomic point of view, people of his generation had perhaps put too much stress on the need to create competitive environments, certainly those which were meant to resemble the notion of competition of the orthodox textbooks of the time. Austin himself has always taken a very balanced and pragmatic approach to both micro and macro aspects of economic policy, combining his understanding of theory with his immense practical knowledge of industry and experience of industry and government. Now let me just mention two other things in closing, in fact one other thing. The final puzzle that I want to raise, which again may be associated with Keynes's tactical sense, and which again with hindsight may appear as another example of faulty tactics, is why Keynes chose to develop the principal arguments of the general theory within the confines of a closed economy model. This too was unusual for Keynes because virtually all of his theoretical and policy work both before and after the general theory was done in the context of an open economy where the economy he usually had in mind uh, was the United Kingdom. It's no accident that the Times obituary of Keynes started by calling him a great economist and then he immediately added that by his death, the country has lost a very great Englishman. Moreover, from the beginning of his career as economist, he had very definite views on the roles of international trade, and especially of international capital movements, in his discussion of price levels and their control in the 1920s, and activity levels and their control in the 1930s and 1940s. Now, it may have been at the level of abstraction at which he was pitching the general theory, he thought that the openness or otherwise the economy wouldn't make any essential difference in practice.
process, in principle, to the process he was analyzing. The practical consequences were very important, as he himself pointed out in various places in that book. Nevertheless, in the final paragraph of the original preface he was to write, the book's chiefly addressed to my fellow economists, its main purpose is to deal with difficult questions of theory, and only in the second place with the applications of this theory to practice. I can't achieve my object of persuading economists to re-examine certain of their basic assumptions, except by highly abstract argument and by much controversy. And he said, at this stage of the argument, the general public, though welcome to the debate, are only eavesdroppers in an attempt by an economist to bring an, to an issue the deep divergence of opinion between fellow economists, which have for the time being almost destroyed the practical significance of economic theory and will, until they're resolved, continue to do so. I fear that these are prophetic words as applicable to our deliberations at this conference today as they were to when Keynes first wrote them. Now, it's true that uh, Keynes's followers soon extended his analysis to the international level, but it was a strange omission by Keynes, for as we've seen, he always had strong views, not always the same, on the importance of capital movements as well as of trade. And moreover, one of his last acts was, of course, was his contributions at Bretton Woods to setting up the IMF and the World Bank uh, in order to guard against the latter creating balance of payments problems that would require contractionary responses. Donald Mogridge has recently chronicled the contribution by Keynes over his entire working life to the issues associated with the international monetary system, and I'll refer you to Mogridge's splendid account. What does emerge from his account is Keynes's subtle and flexible mind his superb blend of understanding of economic processes on the one hand and the practical possibilities of influencing them on the other, given the inevitable political constraints involved. But as always, he was usually too optimistic concerning persuasion and acceptance. His touching belief that others were as disinterested and as full of well-being, uh, as well as being as quick as and intelligent as he was, was not always founded. One characteristic which especially stands out, stands out was his uncanny perception of the different lengths of time involved as between different processes which nevertheless were interrelated, the sort of intuition which only the best economists have had, which is, is ind indispensable if their ethical structures are to serve well both policy proposals and the creation of new institutions. Now, though he was famous for changing his mind, Joan Robinson's favourite story about Keynes is the following. Someone remonstrated with him for being inconsistent, and he said, when someone persuades me that I'm wrong, I change my mind. What do you do? Um, thus his commitment as a liberal to free trade was lower down on his lists of priorities than was his desire to have and to maintain decent levels of employment. But he was a man, as James Meader said, who believed in the freedom of the human spirit so that he did not believe in an economy that had to be excessively controlled but in one where there was the necessary intervention in order to obtain a high level of activity. He was somebody who believed passionately in building a new, decent, liberal and effective international order which was based on conditions which would allow prosperity and expansion to be. He was always consistent on his view that the wage earning classes should not have to carry an unfair burden of the adjustments to the malfunctioning of the economy. Um, the economic consequences of Mr. Churchill, uh, which he published in 1925, and which has recently been brilliantly reinterpreted by Paul Wells, is a relatively early passionate statement of his view. As we've seen, he did argue that if satisfactory levels of activity could be ensured worldwide, an argument could be made whereby the benefits of the classical system, including those flowing from free trade, could be added as a bonus but he would not make free trade, free movements of capital internationally, coupled with freely floating exchange rates, an overriding priority, indeed quite the opposite. And who's to say that he is wrong, or that he was wrong, given the disastrous outcomes of the last 10 to 12 years of an approximation to just those conditions in much of the world? Well, that's the news from Lake Wobegon, where all the women are strong, all the men are good-looking, and all the children are above average. Thank you very much.